Good morning and happy Resurrection Sunday to all of those in the sanctuary and those who are joining us via video. We want to again welcome you and welcome our guest as well this morning. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we lift up this service today in your name, Father, that we are here for no other purpose than to give thanks, praise, honor, and glory to a resurrected Savior. Lord God, how can we ever begin to imagine that this church wouldn't be filled to the walls with people celebrating the fact that you have rose from the dead? Father God, we are praying for those that are not here that somehow, some way, Lord God, that they get this message. Father God, we pray that you give us the desire upon our heart to go to them, those who are not here, and to deliver the good news, the gospel, to them. Father God, that's what you've commanded us to do, and let us be faithful in that. I pray, Father God, that we experience your presence this morning, Lord God, in such a mighty way. We've already experienced your presence in the time of worship, in the time of praise, in the time of thanksgiving and testimony. And we pray, Father God, now that we see your presence fleshed out in your word. Holy Spirit, as always, you are welcome to manifest in any way that you see fit. All of these things we ask in the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we celebrate an empty tomb. I know often you see celebrations of Christ upon the cross, but today we celebrate an empty tomb. Like the song says, we serve a risen Savior. Amen. They said, you know, that's what the angel said. Why you look for the living among the dead? Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is rose. Everybody put today on Facebook, he is risen, he is risen, he is risen. I'm like, that's great. Why didn't you put that yesterday and last Tuesday and a random Friday? Because he was risen for the past 2,000 years. We should celebrate that and live in the midst of his resurrection every day. Death has been replaced with eternal life. Eternal death has been replaced with eternal life. You know, many other religions around the world, people will come in, and it's a valid question, to be honest with you. New Christians come in, they ask the same question. It's a very valid question. It sounds like a simple question, but the answer is so complex. And the question is this, why did Jesus have to die? They ask that over and over again, and many uh, pointed out, some of them would be sarcastic, and you know, why would God have to become man to die for, for, for the sacrifice to God, and they make this big convoluted circle. But I ask you the question again, why did Jesus have to die? And luckily, the simple answer for us has been laid out in Romans. I feel like Brother Michael going to Romans, but he's usually in Romans 8, and we're going to go all over Romans this morning. See there? I got his blessing. We're going to start in Romans chapter 3. How about that? Romans chapter 3, verse 23. This is something you should all know, and if you don't manage it in your notes or go back and watch it, you can Google the Roman road, and this is a wonderful opportunity to answer the question, why did Jesus have to die? Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is a promise of God. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. It is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Right there in those scriptures, Paul has told us exactly the answer to why Jesus had to die. And he's given us the very pathway to follow, the GPS coordinates, if you would, on how do we get to salvation. You know, Brother Michael met out at the Griffin Hill Cemetery this morning. And he had to post directions and put up signs because you, you basically can't get there if you don't know you're getting there. You almost have to get there by accident, it seems like. <clears throat> I figured the cemetery started because somebody got lost and that's just where they died. <laughs> that's all that makes any sense because they ever but the road had to follow a snake to get there. So you had to have a directions to get there. How did you get directions where the dead are? Well, this morning Paul gave us how to get the directions where the live are, where the living are. How to get there. 
We celebrate today the empty tomb. And Paul told us exactly why, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4, he said, I passed on to you what was most important. Now, this was most important to Paul. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins. Just as the Scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. Just as the Scripture said. How many of you believe that Jesus Christ was born, Jesus Christ lived, Jesus Christ was crucified, Jesus Christ was buried, and Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Amen. Amen. If you believe that, then I believe that you have to listen to me on the next most important thing, is you have to believe Jesus Christ is coming back again. Jesus, Him born, lived, crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, and coming back. Don't ever lose that. He goes on in 1 Corinthians. He jumped to verse 17. Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, he said, listen, this is the truth. In fact, Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came in the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Today, Resurrection Sunday, You are not expecting to get up in the morning and be given eggs, peeps. Now, you may be expecting a little Reese's um, peanut butter eggs. That's a reasonable expectation. That's a wonderful gift. How many of you grew up with the plastic baskets wrapped up in cellophane, right? And they had, yeah, those were expectations, right? Maybe you woke up this morning disappointed because you didn't get any of that. And they think you're too old for candy or whatever. But let me tell you this, your reasonable expectation is that today you were given eternal life. Yes, eternal life's even better than peanut butter eggs. It's much better than Cadbury eggs. Those are nasty. Just telling you. Eternal life is better than peanut butter eggs. It's better than eating leftover multicolored egg salad sandwiches for the rest of the week. How about that? I always look forward to that, but you know what? Eternal life is even better than that. We have been given that gift. In that, Paul tells us that. He says, well, you have been given a new life. How many of you have ever had a rough life growing up? How many of you had a poor life? How many of you had a, just times that, you know what? Life has not been good to me. How many of you could sing the old song, gloom, despair, agony on me, deep, dark depression, excessive misery? Wouldn't be for bad luck. I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. I'm old. I know what that means. Many of us did not have the best life growing up. But you know what? God has promised you a new life. Understand the difference. If he just gave you life eternal, the life that you had forever, that ain't very good. I wouldn't want to be stuck in that old life. But better than that, he's given me a new life, and that new life is eternal. The blessings he gave me are going to last forever. Marcy's got a little jar laid out, and it's got some little caramel-filled candies, chocolate for Easter. Now, she'll tell you when that's gone, that's gone. It won't be back out until the next holiday. But you know what? What God's given me, it never runs dry. It's always there. It's always a day to celebrate. I have been given new life. Today we celebrate not only the resurrection, not only the new life we see in Christ when he comes out of the tomb, but we celebrate our resurrection. Those of you who have accepted Jesus Christ have experienced a resurrection. You have experienced a new life. So we celebrate the life of Christ, but then we celebrate the life in In us, the Christ in us, the life in us, which comes from Christ Jesus. Every day is Resurrection Sunday when you are blessed to open your eyes and say, thank you, Lord, for another day. You have just experienced resurrection again. 
you have been reminded of the time you stepped from death into life. There's no closer time in your physical life to death than when you are sleeping. When you are there, and the mind's doing a thousand different things, and you can't control what's going through it. But when you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes, you have complete and total control. And you have the fact to say, thank you, God, for this new day. What do you have for me, Lord? What do you have for me? I want you to fill me with that new life. And again, going back to Romans, we see that in Romans 6, 11 through 14. Paul says, so you should also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin. And say, oh, I still fight. I got so many sins, so many old sins. Those sins cannot live in this new vessel. Sin cannot live in your new vessel. God says, can I not put new wine and old wine in the same skin? Or the old wine will pollute the new wine. I am dead to sin. You say, oh, well, sin still comes in. Yes, sin comes in. But it can't survive there. It can't live there. It, I'd have to feed it. Sin cannot live there. He said, you are dead to the power of sin. And you're alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. He said, you are no longer an instrument of sin. He said, instead of that, he said, now you are what? He said, you're an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. An instrument must be played to actually be what it truly is. I've got, I've got a bunch of instruments in my garage. I've got at least two fiddles. I don't know why. I can't remember where they came from. I've got two of them in there, but I can't play them in the day, and they're, they're of no use at all. I have got to use those instruments. Christ has created in you, and you are a new instrument. He said, you were once an instrument of evil. You know, it's said over and over and over again. Bob Dylan said, you got to serve somebody. You were either an instrument of evil or now you're an instrument of good. An instrument of God's mercy that he has. And you know what? It has to function for an instrument to be of any use. You have got to hear it. You have got to hear it. Every instrument has its voice. We have been blessed with a wonderful praise and worship team here. And it is so great. And you really realize it and appreciate it when you go back to the times when we had no one. In that silence. And now we appreciate it because we hear their voices. And we love that time of praise and worship. Let me tell you, when you leave from here and go out into a world that's dead and dying, and you bring forth with your instrument and give them life, and give them the message of the cross, they will be just as joyful in that because it will speak to their spirit. God is using you as an instrument. Not to say that you have to sing, but you've got to be able to deliver the good news to others. That is what you are here for. If you have experienced new life, if you know what that is to move from darkness into light, then you have to tell someone. Tell somebody, tell somebody, tell somebody. I got a black pastor friend. He says, you know what? He says, you find out something good, he said, you run, go tell that. That's what he says. Run, go tell that. Don't hold on to it. Get it out there. How many of you know someone that sings wonderfully or maybe they play a wonderful instrument, but you never hear it. They keep it to themselves. That's not what that gift was for. It's to be used. Whenever you have that one moment in your life that's just so mad, you just can't keep it inside. When you can remember specifically the day, the time, the hour, the place when you accepted Jesus Christ, that is something that can never be taken from you. That is a gift you should share. That is a memory you should share. Maybe in this room there is someone that does not know when they accepted Jesus Christ. They do not know the point when they stepped over from life into death. They don't celebrate it like a birthday or an anniversary. They don't know when that date is. I'm going to help you. You know what's the best in the world? You can remember Resurrection Sunday, 2024. What easier can you do? You can write it right in the back of your Bible. 331, 2024. This is the day that I accepted Jesus Christ. That I spoke out and declared that Jesus Christ is my Lord. And I believed in my heart, and I believed in my actions from that day forward. What easier day is there to remember than today? Scripture tells us that what is the day of salvation? Today is the day of salvation. 
I don't care if you've been in this church 75 years. If you don't have a point when you can remember that you dedicated your life to Jesus Christ, then make today that day. There is no shame in that. And the opportunity will be given the day when you died and were born again. Then you can sing the old song we used to sing. We used to sing what? I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Old things have passed away. I've been born again. I'm a new creation. I tell people that. I'm a brand new man. I'm not who you once knew. I'm a brand new man. Old things have passed away. I've been born again. That should be the testimony you can give to everyone that you meet. Or maybe you can bring forth what we sung this morning. You can tell them, I wash my robes in the blood of the Lamb. And I love that for that next line. I'm dead to sin, made alive again. I once was dead, but now I live. What a wonderful thing to be able to tell others. Today we tell everyone, He is risen. He is risen. And we realize He's been risen every day for the past 2,000 years. So why do we only proclaim it once a year? He is risen. He is risen. But I'm not telling you that it's self important or comes back on you to be able to say, I am risen. I am risen. To be able to share in the glory of God that says, I am risen, I am saved. He told us. He said, go into all the world making disciples. That means people who learn. And they only learn if you're teaching. So you can go to someone and say, how was your Easter? It was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I rose from the dead. What? I entered the weekend dead and I rose to life Sunday. How would that happen? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you a story. And then you go on the Roman road with them and tell them exactly how it happened. Why do I continually push evangelism? Why, why, why? Well, for one reason, there's still a few empty seats in this place. That's one reason I push evangelism. But one reason I push is the fact that you all in here are disciples once you accept Jesus Christ. And your job is to go out and disciple others. So you leave from this place filled to overfilling, overflowing with the message to give to them. So from today, you'll learn, and you have the Scriptures in Romans, you can tell them. You can tell them that you were dead and that you're alive. That's why I push evangelism. And I push evangelism not just only for the joy and seeing what your life changed in that salvation, but I have one other reason that I push evangelism. I want you all to share in the experience I've had and others in here when you lead someone to Christ. When you, right there with your own eyes, see a new life born. When you see the scales fall from their eyes, as suddenly they get it, they understand, and they accept Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, seeing that new life, it's addictive. You want to see it again and again and again to see the change in people's lives because you've seen what it can do not only to those lives but to the families. You can see changes in them, the next generation. You can see them reaching their parents and grandparents, those generations. You can see the life regenerates over and over and over again. And I've got to tell you, it is addictive. You will once you get started. You cannot stop. How did, the Christ, how did Christianity spread so quickly? It spread so quickly because it was something that was needed. And they saw that it was growing and it became organic and it just began to grow and grow and grow. You get so addicted to it over and over and over again to be able to witness birth firsthand. I worked in hospitals for years and I've seen many births. I was a respiratory therapist 30 years ago. And the problem was we were only called when things were going bad. So I was there, and I've seen a lot of bad births. But I've also been there when things were bad and things were rough, and I get to hear the cry of a child and celebrate. It's the same thing when you see someone come from death into life. When our first child was born, I was at work. I was in Marksville. Marcy was here with her sister. And she called me. She said, I'm going to labor. I said, and she said, I'm going to the hospital. I, said, I hung up the phone. I hung on the phone because I was in Marksville. I needed to get there. So I took off and I got to Rapide. Mm-mm. Cabrini, I'm sorry. That's right. Went to Cabrini. That would have made more sense if I went to the wrong hospital. I got to Cabrini. I said, where's she at? Where's my wife? They're like, what? We don't have anybody. I said, my wife, she's here. She's having a baby. Where's she at? Nobody here. We don't, there wasn't anybody. Being, I don't think any babies being born at that time, if I remember right. No. They said, we don't have any babies. I said, Am I the wrong hospital? Where am I at? So I called her, called her sister. Where are you at? Oh, we're on our way. I'm like, oh, come on. I beat them to the hospital because I had to be there. I've got to be there. I'm not having any way that I'm going to miss this. I've got to see this happening. 
And you know what? I get to do the same thing this October when for the first time we get to become grandparents. Grace is having a baby. I've had to sit on that for one month, and that's been very hard to do. This is my shirt, everybody, for Easter. This is my gender reveal shirt because I can't take a side. I've got to be team blue, team pink. Although we've had so many girls on both sides of the family. But I will know. I don't know how it's going to work out. When we get closer to that week, I mean, we're two hours or so from West Monroe. I don't know how it's going to happen, but we're going to be in a much closer circle somehow, hovering around, waiting. So I'm going to be there. When you get to the chance and the point in life whenever the people that you made begin to make people, then you realize you've got something. And I realized that I brought her and her sister up in a Christian household, surrounded by the Word of God, and I know now that my grandchild is being born into a Christian household by a Christian mother and a Christian father, and I realize that the things that I've done and spoken to their lives are not going to return void. I've spoken into their lives. But how many of us have spiritual children and grandchildren? You've spoken in the life of someone about what you've done. You get to see them come to Christ, and you get to see their family come to Christ, and those are something we celebrate as well, to be able to be in the midst of that. It's why every one of these pews should be filled every Sunday, every Wednesday night. They should be lined up here to hear Brother Michael every Sunday morning for Sunday school. Every time the Word of God is put forward, these pews should be filled to hear the Word of God so you know what to share with others. So that you can be in the presence. I, I can't imagine people that go everywhere. People used to go to revivals and they go to watch people in these big tents. And they'd wheel a wheelchair down the aisle and somebody would be prayed for, healed, and they'd walk out the back of the church. The blind would come up on their canes. They'd be prayed for and healed and they'd walk out with their sight. The deaf would come to the front and they'd pray for them, put their hands on their ears and they'd get their hearing back and they'd leave and everyone would rejoice. That's wonderful. That's great. I fully believe in miraculous healing. But how much more so should you be in the church watching and waiting for someone who is dead to walk down that aisle, receive Christ Jesus, and walk away from here in eternal life? To see the dead walk, the dead live. This church should be packed in anticipation of that. To see what new life looks like. Every Easter I'm reminded of a friend that's no longer with me, with us. But he used to say years ago, he said, For us, Jesus rose from the dead. For him, we won't rise from the bed. And it's true. What he has done for us, and what are we in exchange doing for him? And when we don't, it's selfish, not because we can sleep in longer, but because we lost the opportunity to learn something to tell someone else. Scripture tells us that the good shepherd give up his life for his sheep. I got a question for you this morning. Will you give up your life? What is your life? I'm not talking about dying. Dying's easy, all right? Living's hard. To give up your life. If somebody asks you, did you have a, do you make a good living? Did you have a good life? Everything on your grave between the number here and the number there, that line. Tell me about your life. What it is, you're not looking for the number of days and all. They're looking for the fact of how many moments did you have that were truly filled with joy? Your life that you have. Your life is made up of your needs, your wants, your desires. The things that you filled your life with. The thing that you work for to make a living. Are you willing to lay those things down? Those things that are so important for you to be able to exchange them instead for the things that God has. To give up your life. The life that you've structured. You know, we pass by through Hesmer on Sunday mornings. And there will be 400 cars there. With people there with their kids playing soccer. Nothing against soccer. I don't understand it, but nothing against it. But why does it have to be on Sunday morning? We should be at church. Those kids should be at church. Why on Sunday morning? So now we come on Wednesday nights, and now they're playing on Wednesday nights too. I said, now you're picking on me. I don't like it. You're specifically singling out the time those kids should be at church. I said, I don't know if I just need to go over there and set up a tent and start preaching over there. Either that or I think we need to cut the grass a little shorter out here and start selling hot dogs and let them kick around in between the innings or whatever you do for soccer. We'll preach them the Word of God. Maybe that's what we need is play soccer here. I don't know. I don't know. But I know that those, those things, those wants, those desires that they have to see their kids entertained, needs to be replaced with the wants and desires to see their kids growing up in the admonition and the instruction of Jesus Christ. To receive the Word of God. That's what is needed. That's what we need to see. 
Just like God gave you an exchange, He gave you eternal life for eternal death, He can also give you the desires of your heart. And that doesn't mean that if you desire a new Jeep or whatever it may be that you desire, or a new house, that He's going to give you that. What it means is that the desires you had will be taken out and replaced with the desires that He has. The things that God's heart longs for, that yearns for, that's what happens. It, it's to be able to satisfy not your selfishness, but to, be able to satisfy God's intent. And Psalm 37 4 tells us that. It says, If you take delight in the Lord, then He will give you the desires of your heart. Do you delight in the Lord? Do you say, like the scripture says, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord? And not just when you got to get here for 11, but when you got to be here in the graveyard at 7 o'clock. How many of you were excited to be able to get up and be out there at 7 o'clock in the morning? Or here for 9 o'clock? Brother Michael, you my witness. If they can make it here for church at 9, I'm guessing they can make it to Sunday school at what time? 10. You can sleep an extra hour. Why are we not getting everything of God that we can get? It's because our desires are in front of His desires. If you delight in the Lord, then that means you rejoice in the things that God rejoices in. And He rejoices in no more. All of heaven dances when one lost sinner comes to God. Why would you not want to see that happen? You say, oh, we don't see it every Sunday. That's all right. That's all right. If you're not here, you'll never see it. You've got to be here to see a changed life that takes place. If you delight in the Lord, you rejoice in things that make him happy. Then you'll allow your desires to be replaced with his desires. Then and only then have you laid down your life truly if you've replaced your desires with what God desires. If you're working ever to be able to fulfill the, the two commandments that Jesus gave, he said, love your Lord God above all others. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then when he was part, departing this world, he said, i got one more thing I need you to do. What do I need you to do? Go ye therefore and make disciples. Spread the good news, spread the gospel, make disciples. That's it. That's your job. That's what you've been told to do. That's what you've been given as an, to do. If you don't have it, you can't give it. You've got to be able to have that love of God to be able to show others the love of God. You've got to have within you the Word of God before you can share with them the Word of God. Then you discover what true religion is. And religion has nothing to do with denominations and all this. That's all man. Man did all that. Some say, oh, well, we're not a religion, we're a relationship. And yeah, that's true. But Jesus, we read about, we know what he intended because James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this. Look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We know we're supposed to take care of the poor, the hungry. We know we're supposed to do that. But the other thing he said you've got to do is you've got to protect yourself from the pollution of this world. You've got to be filled with Christ so that there's no room for anything of the world to come in. You want to know how to keep sin out of your life? Keep Christ in your life. There is no room. There is no room. People used to worry about the Ten Commandments, all the things thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. If you do the things where he says thou shalt... If you do the things you're supposed to do, you ain't got time to do the things you ain't supposed to do. That's like some Jethro logic right there, right? Then why are we not doing it? Why are we not doing it? Why are we not doing everything in our power to bring others to Christ? You say, well, how can you believe that? Because there are pews empty. You know, they say numbers don't matter. I've told you all before, every number represents a soul. Every empty seat in this church can be filled with someone who needed to hear about Jesus Christ today. And I've got to tell you this, if you don't invite them, they're not coming. It ain't just by accident. They spend billions of dollars advertising products in this country. And they do it because they know what works. I had a guy sitting on a plane one day, and I said, what do you, what do? You do? He said, well, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in advertising. And the guy said, no, he said, well, he said, well, he said, I got to tell you, he said, I, he said, my family were original owners of Coca-Cola. He said, Coca-Cola? He said, man, you ain't never got to work again. He said, no. He said, well, I don't, he said, well, I got to ask a question. I'm in advertising. I don't have your account. He said, but 
He said, I see the billions of dollars y'all spend on advertising. Why do y'all do that? You're Coca-Cola. Why would you spend a nickel on advertising? He says, because the second that we stop advertising our product, he said, the other one, the competition is going to increase, and they're going to take everything from us. He said, do you believe that? He said, yeah, I believe that. So in this church, whenever you're not going out espousing Jesus Christ to the lost, someone out there is espousing them to do something else on Sunday morning than to be here. They're giving them something else that they call life, the better life, what, what is that one of the TV preachers talks about? Their best life, right? Yeah. Their best life is here, learning about the Word of God and sharing the Word of God. That's life. That's what life is. If you're not telling them, then some of the world's telling them something else. You've got to find a way to replace their desires with what God desires. The constant urge to make sure that the needs of others are met, not the corrupt things that the world tells us that we need. I ask a question this morning. It says, have you laid down your life and been born again? Have you done this in word and deed? I'm asking it to everyone here. Have you laid down your life? Is there one point in your life where you know that you laid down your life and were born again? So I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. I'm going to give you a reminder in what Paul told us. Romans 10, 9 through 10. Is this you? Ask yourself that. Have I openly declared that Jesus is Lord? Have I believed in my heart that God raised him from the dead? If so, I will be saved. For it's by believing in my heart that I am made right with God. It's by openly declaring my faith that I am saved. Is this you? Have you done this? Have you declared Jesus Christ as Lord? Have you lived your life as though you believe it? Would others, when they witness you and see your life, do they believe it? Do they see Christ Jesus in you? Have you openly declared your faith in that you are saved? Is that you? Is that you? Can you say that yes? And the cameras are turned off. We've got none of that. We don't need any of that. This is just us talking here. Have you ever declared that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Have you lived your life as though He is your Lord and Savior? Have you done what He told you to do? Have you loved God above all others? Have you loved your neighbor above yourself? And have you went and told others about Jesus Christ? He's commanded to do that. Have you done those things? That is the action upon your life that I see that you have accepted Jesus Christ. Have you declared and have you believed? If you have not, there's no shame. I want you to come down the aisle this morning. And I want to pray with you. And I want you to write that in the back of your Bible when you get home. If you don't have a Bible, you're not going to leave me here without one. I'll give you one. And you're going to write that date in there. 331-2024. This is the date. I don't care if you just walked in this church or you've been in this church for 100 years. Today is the day. Would there be any that today would accept Jesus Christ as their Savior? to declare and believe. Do you have any in your family that you know have not accepted Christ? Then I want you to stand in for them this morning. Stand up where you are. If you know anyone that is not living a life in an example of Jesus Christ, I want you to stand where you are and you're going to stand in for them, and we are going to pray for them today in belief. Now, I need people who pray who believe that you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ can and will save them, and you're going to do everything in your power to bring them to Christ. The altars in the aisle are open. If anyone would have that, we would pray for you right now today. Today's the day. But if you have anyone in your family to pray for, I want you to pray where they are, where you are right now. Father God, I myself am standing. I'm standing in the gap for those in my own family, I know, who have either never accepted you or, Lord God, have walked away from you. I pray, Father God, that even today you give me the boldness to speak into their lives. I pray, Father God, that you send someone, if they won't listen to me, send someone in their lives, Lord God, to spread the gospel, the good news to them. 
I pray right now, Lord God, believing in the fact that they will declare you with their mouths and live in a belief, Father God, that you are the Christ, that you are their King and you are their Lord. Father God, I want to be able to come back in a few weeks and say, look, I prayed and I stood in the gap for so and so, and they accepted Jesus Christ. Father God, we're praying for them now. We're lifting up our friends, our family, our loved ones that do not know you. And now, Father God, I specifically pray for all of those in this sanctuary that you would give them boldness and the power that comes through the Holy Spirit. Father God, if they've not been filled with the Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord God, that they seek out me or another leader in this church or someone they trust and would pray with them to receive the Holy Spirit. From in the Holy Spirit, Lord God, we know that we get power and we get boldness. And Father, you've told us that you will recall to our memory the things that we've read and heard and seen so that we can tell others about you. I pray, Father God, for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon this sanctuary. I pray, Lord God, even now in belief that we will fill this place up where people have received you as their Savior. Not, Lord God, for that we can boast, but instead then come into this church, hear the Word of God, and go out and bring others into the kingdom. I pray, Father God, this morning, all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord God a hand clap of praise. You've got your marching orders. Leave from here.